Hi, um, I'm Steph. I'm the literary manager at the Almeida, and I'm here with Anne Washburn, who's the writer of Shipwreck and uh, other plays like Mr. Burns that was here in 2014, and Twilight Zone, which was here in 2017, <laughs> and just opening in, uh, in the West End. Um, and James Graham, who wrote Ink, um, which was on here in 2017, um, is about to open on Broadway imminently. Yeah. Um, and other plays like Tory Boys and This House and Labour of Love, The Boat. Um, and we thought it'd be a good idea to get you two together because you've both sort of written plays that deal with kind of politics with a big P, um, the fallout of elections, um, people who are responsible for and responding to events of kind of great political change. Um, but I think you're quite formally different as well. So it feels like it's a different experience going to an Anne Washburn play to going to a James Graham play. And yet I think there are similarities in the way you sort of avoid partisanship. Maybe you both sort of um, kind of pride yourself on like writing opposing views um, with sort of the same amount of weight and humanity. So I thought we'd have a chat about that for um, about 30 minutes and then I might open it up to the audience for any questions. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, the first thing I'm kind of interested in um, looking into is how you choose the subjects that you write plays about because sort of shipwreck is to an extent a Trump play but it's not a White House play, it's about a group of friends in a farmhouse upstate and a couple in the 70s who adopt a Kenyan boy um, and like Ink for example is sort of about the shift over the last 50 years of the kind of populist Mm. Um, ideology from kind of the left-wing working class to the right, but it's done through the birth of the Sun newspaper. So I'm sort of interested in why it is that when you're sort of wanting to talk about a political idea or a political period, what helps you sort of focus in on the particular figures that you're going to write about? Right. I'm actually more interested to hear your answer to this than I am. <laughs> right. But, it, but we're you... sat on the stage of your play, so you should probably go first. <laughs> All right, then this will be quicker on my side. <laughs> Only to say that, um, I mean, because I, I think you, you consistently choose topics, and I'm curious how you make that choice or how you make the choice to go in. And Shipwreck wasn't a, I didn't decide I was going to write a Trump play. I had a lot of um, political thoughts and language I wanted to kind of um, deal with on what I thought would be a purely personal kind of way. And um, in following that impulse, I ended up writing what increasingly became a play. So it was really just about feeling that... Um, because of events in America, that that was the primary um, that was the primary narrative and dialogue happening in my head, and to approach anything else at that particular time would be skirting around this enormous um, political elephant in my brain. So I just went at it. Um, so it wasn't so much a question of choice in that mm. way. So I'm more interested mm. in hearing about your intentional no choices. Well, it's a similar kind of thing. So I. I um I really like, uh, have a geeky love of uh, institutions um, and systems. And so I, I, without meaning to, I feel like I'm ticking off or moving around um, great British institutions, whether that be Parliament or, or, or Fleet Street. But, but I guess when you arrive there and you think, oh, I want to tackle this now, I want to make sense of uh, this body or this power, or um, whatever the anxiety or the condition of the country or even myself um, at that time kind of infuses the mood or the theme mm -hmm. of it. So when I, I, I knew I wanted to write a play about the news because um, news felt like uh, in the aftermath of Brexit and the leading up to Trump, um, that was, um, it was something that felt at a, at a crossroads and quite dangerous and something that was changing the language in our news media was changing. Um, but I didn't know what the play was about until I started writing it, and then it just naturally became about um, populism because mm -hmm. of my own anxieties and fears and, and curiosities about that. So I think whatever, uh, I, if I write a, um, a play about, uh, I think of another institution, the courts next, I just think um, I try and get a sense of the systems and the processes, mm. um, but whatever, whatever state we're in as a nation, mental, philosophical, spiritual, I think... Um, it will absorb into the, the bricks and mortar of the play in a way. Do you start with research around the topic first and then at some point in there something kindles and you, you start approaching toward that? Or do you have a loose sense of where you might be heading and then as you head there, sort of research around that path as you go toward it? Oh, yeah, good question. I don't think I know. I mean, I, uh, um, 
Well, because a lot of my research is, is uh, in order to make the plays work, it's some pretty mundane stuff, like what kind of tie do you wear at that kind of, mm. in that kind of office and where do you go for your lunch? And it's, but, I, but within that, I, I generally find within the detail of, and the, of, the, of the processes of how you make a newspaper or how you get legislation through a, a, a parliament, um, na naturally um, characteristics and, and metaphors and, and uh, a mood will emerge out of that that I don't have to impose necessarily upon it. But um, um, yeah, no, I don't know. But I mean, for, I guess for you, I mean, so when you were writing, I assume some of you are going to see this tonight and you're in for a real treat, but it feels, I, I'm really surprised to hear that. If it feels from like the very beginning that the, the motivating desire to write this play was to make sense of the, of the existential dread that we all currently feel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, it was very much. I just, uh, I didn't intend for it to be, I didn't say, oh, this would be a good play. I thought I have, um, I started it on a silent playwriting retreat. So I had a period of time okay. in which I would be separated from the news. You know, my first period of time mm. of being separated from the news uh, for, you know, years at that point. You know, but, but I was going to have this blank slate to deal with. Um, so into that, I just began dropping language and wow. trying to see what, was, what would happen if I cleared out my head without the new inrush of input mm. that I was you know, getting on a daily basis. Yeah. So. Good. Yeah, it feels like they both sort of started a, a little bit from, from language, from sort of mm. thinking about how it is that we're talking about politics now. Certainly it feels like shipwrecks coming from that and whether there are sort of the codes of the sort of worlds that you're thinking about that kind of lead you to talking about, to, to the metaphors or to the bigger sort of picture ideas. Yeah, but I, I feel like uh, I feel like I'm lucky as a as a British playwright in that so many of our systems and institutions and processes are so old and therefore <laughs> quite ludicrous and stupid <laughs> that they um, the chaos that they sometimes find themselves in, um, mm. or they just naturally speak to a. I feel like every single play about a British institution naturally. Uh, by default becomes a bit of an origin story, uh, yeah. which is probably very arrogant of us because we think we start everything. But when I was writing This House at the National, it, uh, although it was a play about 1970s whips in Parliament, it, because of the age of that building and because of the rituals that naturally exist in something that old and, and without a written constitution, I feel like, I don't know, they, they naturally gain a metaphorical significance that I feel, I feel very lucky as a British playwright to have just because there's so much resource. Well, what's so wonderful about this house is the degree to which, I mean, there's so many things that are so wonderful about it, but the degree to which everyone within the institution is struggling to make sense of the institution, which is, of course, dramaturgically and expositionally very helpful yeah, yeah. as well. Um, mm. Not that our institutions aren't, um, they're not as, as grandiose in their confusion, I guess. Right. It's still intricate. And you have, uh, you know, you have a constitution, you have things written down, you have something, yeah, I think you've, you have um, clear guidelines. Mm -hmm. Not that you always follow them and not that they, that they always make sense. But um, yeah, we, we sort of weirdly, we don't. So we, we, we have precedents and which we break and we have uh, traditions which we resent. And, and I think, um, yeah, no, that's what just, I find that very useful. And is there a tricky balance at all between when you are writing about real people or real events, like what happened, <laughs> what words were spoken, of kind of getting um, attention to the sort of fidelity of the facts and then sort of the dramatic licence of where you're sort of whether you can push that into an imaginative space and sort of how you manage the balance between... Because I feel like that's... Mm -hmm. When we did the legal read of Shipwreck, which I loved reading because it was hilarious, um, it felt like I was going through going, oh, you've done your research so closely because there are all of these incidents where it's like, this may be defamatory, but oh, no, this he said the crazy thing then. And yet then it also still manages to go into quite strange imaginative spaces. Um, and sort of I was wondering about what the balance is between how you kind of manage to keep the fidelity to what was said when and... Right. I mean, I guess I feel like in any, any play that you do, you know, uh, if you research a history play, um, where it's, it's all very um, emotionally inert or much more emotionally inert, I feel the thing of that is you do a lot of research and then you write the play toward the things that you're unable to locate through research, the things that you want to know and that history does not know. Do you know that that's a, mm. a pretty easy dramaturgical imperative when you're writing with a lot of material. And then in the present, it becomes very different. So actually, yes, Shipwreck was written very 
I feel like defensively is the wrong term, but I think it's really accurate. Um, I, because in writing it, I had spent a lot of time looking at alternative websites, um, you know, sort of right-wing news sources, and uh, and at the same time was very much living a, a much more left-wing uh, liberal existence. I was very aware of the degree to which I um, wanted to make it an accurate response to objections I knew would be raised on the other side. So I didn't, in a weird way, I didn't want to leave it vulnerable to that. So, sure. um, so it's quite accurate um, up to a point, and then um, then where it goes into a world of license, uh, it, it's, it can't be. Um, I didn't want to leave it open to a defense, uh, uh, an attack of, um, I don't know, overreaching the facts. I will say that um, in some ways I think, the discussion of the Trump lie, for example, the language which uh, Yusuf uses in describing the lie is all pretty much exactly Trump's language. And it's been interesting to me the degree to which it's, it's difficult for people to hear how outrageous that lie is. And I think it's because I've struck very accurately to Trump's language. And there is something about Trump's language in those situations, which is, it's more than Teflon. I mean, it's actively sort of silicon slippery. Um, and I think to actually sort of exp, you know, describe the lie, I would have to really make up the language he used around it for us to be able to properly hear it as a lie. Um, so, there, so there is that, which is entirely about writing a place at in a present moment. It's a concern that would not occur um, for something that was even 10 years in the past. It's interesting in that way. And, yeah, I'm quite interested in that idea of that, because that's obviously something that's talked about in Shipwreck. Um, a mm -hmm. character says, um, aren't plays for the eternal moment, they can't be for the contemporary moment. And it seems like Shipwreck, and you've spoken about it a yeah. bit as being a sort of experiment um, in, can, is it possible to write about the current moment? And I know sort of with a play like This House, you are looking retrospectively um, and with hindsight on a period of history that does have contemporary resonance. Yeah. But then also with your Brexit drama, you were writing, um, that was the sort of Channel 4 yeah. Brexit drama, you were writing about something that was to an extent <laughs> unfolding and we still don't know where it's going and we still don't know what the fallout from those campaigns were. And I'm sort of interested in what you found the kind of challenges or, or sort of opportunities that you get from writing about something, writing about the current moment rather than in hindsight. Um, yeah, well, I guess the challenge is as your characters identify in the play. And actually, I, I, I was sat right there watching your play with people talking about political theatre. I felt, felt a bit trolled for a bit, but um, <laughs> it was... Uh, no, I, I thought I loved it. I loved all that stuff. And I think that, yes, what you aspire to, um, in, a, in what I hope is not an arrogant way, but a, a, an artistic aspiration is for your play... For, brutally, for your plays to last, for them to be relevant. Um, as a, as a set standard in 40, 50, 100 years' time. And by doing that, it's, you fight, try and find the, the universals um, uh, and the broader, the broader meanings in it rather than the specifics of, of the now. So going, it's a bit of a cheat to go back, to, I think, to an historical um, uh, reference point because they naturally acquire, I think, again, I've said this word again, but they naturally acquire that sense of allegory or metaphor. And by doing that, that's why Arthur Miller was such a genius to not do a verbatim courtroom play to make sense of the McCarthy trials. He, he, he found something much more poetic and beautiful and one of the best political plays of all time in The Crucible. Um, so with this silly Brexit drama I did on Channel 4, which I thought was entirely uncontroversial, um, <laughs> I genuinely did until I went on Twitter, that um, uh, yes, to an extent you are chasing the story, but in a way still not. I mean, it was three years ago, that vote, two and a half years ago. Um, and I gave myself certain strictures of going, well, you can't leave the confines of that campaign, and regardless of what happens tonight uh, in this particular vote, that campaign still happened, and those things are still knowable, and they must mean something, even if our hindsight, if, even if the future changes our opinion of the past. So, yeah, you just have to, I feel like you, just, you have to give yourself... Um, give yourself boundaries. And, and of course, uh, as Anne says, the, the, the main fear is that you, uh, you, it's how you combat your own bias and your own natural prejudice and play devil's advocate with your own views on these things, because of course we all have them. I think we're also in a uniquely difficult, or um, I guess I'll say intriguing position as dramatists right now, which is that there is so much information. So that if you say that you know the great advantage Shakespeare had was that he was writing um, 
political dramas with um, with, with very little information. Or yeah. he was pulling the histories he was pulling from were very sketchy. So he had a world of of creating he had to do. Um, and Arthur Miller, his great advantage was that he was writing in a time when he could not speak about it directly. He yes, did have censorship, yeah. which is yeah. so great for art. So he um, he was <laughs> yes. toggling around yeah. that. And we we really don't have censorship. And we also have you know six million pieces of information mm. to sort of negotiate in that way. So I think it is a much more delicate, challenging, and kind of in a way unprecedented set of um, uh, opportunities. Yeah. So it's harder for us than Shakespeare. I yeah, like absolutely. <laughs> I would agree. And uh, um, but what I again, what I uh, this shouldn't be a love of each other's work. But what I loved about all of your work, but uh, uh, uniquely in this, of course, as well as it's it's about um, perception and reality, and how reality is changing. The frame through which we view things is, is becoming very distorted, and we each out we we each now because of our phones and because of our bubbles that we walk around in, we each. We used to share at least some common uh, uh, squares by which we would get our information, whether that would be the nightly news or um, um, pamphlets. Um, now, my, we all walk around in, in 60 million different Britons, and we see it through in 60 million different ways. Um, in, a, in a weird kind of way, I think that means theatre is uniquely brilliantly able to, to, to hold that in a way that the naturalism or the literalism of TV and film isn't. Um, and it gives you license, and if you're watching it tonight, I'll try not to spoil it, but there are two exceptional moments of theatre um, at the end of each act where um, a, a, a style and a form and a tone is placed onto a real-life event, but it's, it is entirely exaggerated and, and imagined. Um, uh, but I think, in a weird kind of way, have, have you all seen it? You're going to watch it tonight, so I can't really talk about it. Um, <laughs> There was a moment, can I, what can I say? It's your play and I'm ruining it. Uh, there was a moment when a, when a, when a very recognisable US president um, <laughs> is having a meeting with, with somebody. Um, and in a weird kind of way, even though, it's, even, though it's, um, even though it's extreme and comic, I would say it's closer to the essence of truth than doing a documentary version of that scene would be because it captures um, the essence of his own unreality. He is a fictional character that he's created on a reality TV show that's now the president of the United States, but a fictional character, I think, is running your country. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, so, and so you're now, you are entirely justified and maybe theatre better than the news to make sense of that. And you did. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to pick up on sort of something that you were saying about, um, about sort of the necessity to give, um, give voice to sort of two of the like opposing opinions mm. constantly and sort of to be able to balance those. And I think this is something that you mentioned that you were interested in, the idea of is there a danger in giving charisma right, right, right. To, to views that maybe are, are against your own political inclination? And what responsibility do you feel to do that? And also maybe culpability if those ideas do get more airtime or oxygen or charisma from, from you putting them on stage in yes. a particular Formal way. Yes, I really wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, I have two examples of this. One is a very minor one from one of my own plays, which is uh, in the play Mr. Burns, which is set after the sort of civilization has fallen, and so there are no consumer products as we know them. Um, a group of characters are sitting around seven years after the fall of civilization, uh, reminiscing about Diet Coke, and they used to love Diet Coke, and of course you can't recreate that. Um, what happened to all the Diet Cokes? Where have they gone? When was the last time they had a Diet Coke? They discussed the experience of drinking a Diet Coke. And I myself, and here is where I may alienate um, many of you more fundamentally than in any other way I have done so far. <laughs> I I'm really opposed to Diet Coke. I think it's oh quite evil. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> That's terrible. No, I totally agree. Um, and so I felt, uh, but some people are, are fanatics. So I, I recognize that need in human nature to have Diet Coke. <laughs> So, it, you know, as they were talking about the Diet Coke, I, you know, one of the characters says that was a really scary soft drink and I'm glad it's gone. <laughs> and as a, as a reputable dramatist, I gave that argument to the character who was sort of the most at odds with everyone else in the scene. Um, and she sort of says it and they're like, oh, no, no. And she says, no, no. And, and in my mind, that was sort of a balanced discussion of it. And I sort of, in my heart, somewhere felt... <clears throat> You know, I, perhaps people come away from this a little bit rethinking Diet Coke. <laughs> and any theater that I've had any contact with that's done this play, they've, of course, if they weren't already cheekily offered Diet Coke, you know, at intermission. And they've always said that sales go way up. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like I tried to do the right thing by the truth as I know it. <laughs> and 
and it and it just sort of fell all into the other camp. And the other example being the movie Wall Street, in which uh, the Michael Milken character has the played charismatically by um, oh God, Michael Douglas. Yeah, uh, has the phrase "greed is good," and this is a phrase which you would think is 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 set in context by the entire movie. Um, this is not meant to be your takeaway from it. Really, the contrary. But the degree to which that phrase, greed is good, became the mantra for a generation of particularly rapacious young Wall Streeters, just because it was delivered by a guy who, at the moment he said it, looked cool and assured. And it was a catchy phrase. And it just lit them in a certain way and gave license to them. Um, and all the rest of the movie be damned. So those two tiny yeah. examples of, of, yeah, what happens when when you, uh, you give that kind of attention to the other argument, you know, the degree to which it's good theater but bad politics and maybe terrible politics. Yeah, and even um, irresponsible, which was some of the um, criticisms or accusations I would leveled at me during the Brexit movie, um, which I took really seriously. But, um, and obviously they came from one side of the argument, one section of society who didn't want or didn't feel ready to um, basically uh, to lionize or turn into a hero, someone they think has destroyed the country. Um, and it, was, it took the form of um, the, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch played uh, a character called Dominic Cummings who ran the Vote Leave campaign. Um, and even in advance of the um, screening, there was a, a slightly unhelpful trailer from, no offense, the Americans who um, <laughs> made a very American-y trailer. So it was all, in the year 2016. And, 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 it made it seem like a thriller and that uh, the head of Vote Leave was a kind of reckless but kind of romantic um, anarchist. Um, and so, yeah, I thought about this a lot. But, uh, but I, in a way, my, the devil's advocate part of my brain would err on wondering if, if the opposite is, is worse. If it's more, if it's certainly for bad theatre, bad drama to make um, the controversial figures or the dangerous figures. Um, boring, clearly wrong, two-dimensional. Um, I, I think to, to imbue them with, a, with, with um, empathy, dare I say it, uh, and, try, and, and, try, and an attempt to try and understand what motivates them is always what excites me. And, you know, when you go... So on this stage, trying to do that with Rupert Murdoch was um, surprising, and um, I sort of enjoyed... I sort of enjoyed what does Rupert Murdoch think he's doing that's good. Yeah. And what's the most generous version I can think of that? What's, yeah. what, th what does he think the problem is? And there were problems that he was trying to fix and overturn. And I think that can only be a healthy exercise, especially in this day and age when we are so tribal and so factional and um, struggle to reconcile other people's points of views. I think that can only be a, a, a good thing. But I recognise, of course, yeah, giving charisma and charm to, especially when it comes to views that are, that are abhorrent, racist, sexist, misogynist. There's the, um, yeah, there's a the responsibility. Well, but I will say also, this having only just occurred to me, um, that, uh, and it justifies both of us, which is great, <laughs> um, which is that, again, speaking of this, this, the degree to which we live siloed lives in terms of not, you know, information yeah. um, and political affinity and, and emotional affinity, we're emotionally siloed in huge ways, um, that we become weak in our lines of argument. We fall into patterns of you know, agreement, political agreement rather than political argument. And that when you are presented with the whatever you conceive of as being the opposition, and it's charismatic, and mm. it's sympathetic, and it's um, empathetic, I mean, hopefully you do, you know, that is how that, that person or that argument appears to a large set of, of people who are not actively seeking evil. Yeah. You know, they, are not, they are not drawn to the evil of the side. They are drawn to what they see a, as the, the good of the side. And it's only when you understand it from that direction that you can like, both become a more emphatic, empathetic, uh, well-rounded human being, but also develop a stronger political argument. Do you know, yes, we become you know, stronger yeah. as a yeah. society by the degree to which we are able to not only come to agreement with each other, which we need to be far better at, mm -hmm. but we need to be better arguers with each other. Right now we're just sort of slamming um, badly, badly thought out positions at each other. And the degree to which we're all more cunning, we make each other stronger in our response. So yeah. I think it's great that we're giving charisma to I, people. I agree. <laughs> Yeah, I think if you if you agree that you're you you are so certain that you are right, that's quite a dangerous position, and in a way, sort of giving charisma to the other side is a is a challenge to that. Yeah, um, I think maybe it's a good idea to um, see if the audience have any questions sure. at the moment. 
Uh, yeah, just because uh, what you said about James when you spoke about your anxiety and the way you choose the subject of your plays and your responsibility, and without spoiling the play, I'm thinking also about the moment uh, when you deal with Euripides. Euripide. Uh, my question is, what do you really expect from your audience? You write for yourself, but you also write for an audience. So what will you be your ideal person watching your show, your play, and getting out of the audience of, of a theater and speaking about your play, what would you expect them to think and to feel? Oh and God! To, to keep in their heart and in their mind. It's an extremely good question. I, I feel like there is n there is no. <laughs> I, I feel like there is no knowing. I mean, I guess I feel like if an audience left one of my plays and they all had the same feeling about it and they all had the same questions. I mean, I guess a quick way of saying it is I'd prefer people leave with questions rather than answers, for sure. Um, but I feel like if everyone left with the same questions, the play would have failed in a really fundamental way. That's my thought on that. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I mean, also, I'm a, bit of, uh, I'm a bit of a tart for entertainment. So for, like, fundamentally, I also want them to have enjoyed I've gone on a narrative journey, an emotional journey, enjoyed a story, had access to worlds that feel sometimes um, blocked off from us, that now feel more open. Um, to go straight home onto Wikipedia and go, that can't be true, did this happen, did this happen? Um, and on a higher level, uh, I suppose I... Yeah, I mean, I, my, if, at the moment, probably just based on this conversation, my, big, my greatest fear for all of us, including me, is our inability to um, uh, to to empathise with with new views and different views, and to break out of the, the the box that we're all in, and I include myself in that. So even if just a small opening of a new thought, even if that's oh maybe uh, just a curiosity, I suppose a curiosity about oh that's what motivates uh, Rupert Murdoch, or that's why people buy the Sun newspaper, or, or that's why leave one in these certain towns. A curiosity about that that may have naturally been just blocked off <laughs> as a pointless question to ask, I think. Anyone else? Cool. Um, so a question for both of you referenda and commercial sufferings aside, is there a, an institution or a subject that you're too scared to write about? <laughs> and if so, why? <laughs> 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 I answered the last question first, so... Yeah, uh, good. Um, uh, well, I've never known whether, whether it's referenda or referendum, so I'm thinking about that, but... Uh, um, uh, I don't... The tr it sounds cavalier to say, but I don't think so. I think there are things that I, I shouldn't write about, as a given... Um, there are things that I don't think is, uh, my, is my story to tell right now. Um, I would include the Me Too movement on that, for example, or anything, so I, I think... Um, there are things I don't, don't think I should, but I don't think I'm scared of anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure I am, but I don't, I, I won't even know what they are. You know, ten years from now, I think I'll know what I'm too scared to write now. So there's a dodge, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone else? Uh, sure. Your plays, I think, have mostly played in New York, London, both of you, and I'm interested in if that, if that's meant that they've been seen by a particular type of audience, a theatre-going audience in London and New York. And I wonder how you think about getting your productions or your plays to a broader audience and getting different types of responses, if that's something that concerns you or you think that's happening already? I mean, yeah, we, yeah. Had, we had emailed a bit about mm. this. Um, yeah, that's sort of the obsessive question. The audience is the other character in the play. Um, and, and certainly in New York and certainly in London and certainly in the theaters where I've been done, um, it's not like it's all one kind of an audience, but um, there's a ton of people who either don't go to the theater or don't go to see my plays at least. Yeah, I, I'm obsessed with the question of who's not coming, how to get them to come, how to bring them to the theater, um, how much more entertaining it would be for everyone if you had just a, a much more representative in every single way um, group of people in the room. And we, we were talking a little bit about the fact of sort of nat uh, the nature of theatre in itself being sort of finite and yeah. exclusive. If, if both of your plays play for eight weeks at the Almeida, mm. and even if they have a little further life in 
the West End or Broadway, that's a very small number of people that will see the show. And if you are writing about populism and mass manipulation yeah. and mob mentality, is it an appropriate form, um, theatre, with, with those sort of restrictions, to talk about those things that are much more to do with a much broader move, sort of intellectual and ideological movement? <laughs> well, yes, I have to think that because otherwise I'd retire. But I think I just, I think yeah, I, yeah, it's not just obviously the power of theatre is not just numerically how many people can can see it. Um, um, and but I'm apolog unapologetic about really enjoying an opportunity to to write for TV and film because of the the wider audience that you can reach. Um, but the power of theatre, of course, is, is, is the shared experience in the live room of a community of people, and that sometimes that might be in Islington, or sometimes that might be in whole. Um, but yeah, like, like Anna says, it, there's, there's, um, it, it bothers me massively. I, I didn't come from a theatre background, I didn't come from London. Um, uh, uh, and you're vaguely aware that, that your audience has probably seen a lot of plays, probably, if, they, if they're coming to the Armada. Um, I don't know how you fix it, there's this, this systematic um, um, institutional problems with, with that, apart from trying to get your work to tour. Um, but in terms of, I don't know how, if it changes the content, except more well, like you. I mean, you're, you're incredible at using um, popular culture uh, as a way of, of um, liberating it, theatre from its pomposity, uh, making it feel more accessible. Um, I mean, not always. <laughs> Plays that the Almeida does, <laughs> too. Um, I guess I feel like, I actually, and I actually feel like that's a question which is, is so obsessing the hearts of so many uh, people in the theater, I think that's something which is going to change. I think the question of, of really sorting out how to bring more people into the room, whether it's by you know, marketing or audience outreach right now is a very small part of a theater institutionally, even a theater which really does care about it. And I, I don't know, I think, I think searching out new audiences and whether it's about bringing people in or going to them in different ways, I have a real feeling in the next five, 10 years is gonna be something that really uh, happens in a more developed way. I do think that just in terms of sheer, uh, sheer quantity of bodies reached, and maybe this is just something that I, I want to believe, um, but I do believe that theater is potent in that um, it may be that only a couple of thousand people see something, but that if it's, uh, you know, if it has that kind of electricity, if it has a kind of a charge, I think, uh, I think it can spread, you know? So uh, just the fact that it doesn't immediately reach that many people mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it can't, because it is an area in which you can really talk about ideas in a, a really sort of complicated, long-form way, or emotions in a really complicated, long-form way. I do think it has the potential of, um, oh, uh, you know, it's sort of a viral infection of the culture. A mm. potent, potent, difficult, diseasey thing. That is the kind of thing a playwright would really love to think. Yeah, so. but I think if you if if you are doing what we talked about, that sort of cracking open of empathy a little bit, even just on one yeah. person, then that potentially has a collateral effect on five people around them. Right, you have to think that way. <laughs> yeah. There was I, that. Um, uh, this probably is either not true or I've exaggerated it, but there is that slightly romantic. Um, Study. I think it was the London School of Economics did, where they examined uh, an audience's heartbeat, and there is, there is, they did say that an audience eventually heartbeats rhythm starts to match each other's, uh, which is very oh, sentimental. But I think actually there's something really pr profound in that. And look, I mean, look, there's a reason why you can go, you could go home now and you could watch Star Wars on your phone, this multi-million-dollar space epic, um, and yet. For, Theatres are still full. There's a human need, I think, to feel part of a community, especially now in this incredible condition we're living through, um, which feels sometimes very scary and unpredictable. I think we still want to sort of be together a lot and sort of experience stories together. And, and, uh, and that human need, I don't think, is ever going to go away. Um, and I still think the very act of assembling in a space feels quite political. Um, we, we, I, I've never really known. I, I sometimes feel like I don't write political theatre. You definitely write political theatre. Sometimes I feel like I just write theatre about politics, um, which is a different thing. But uh, obviously, the theatre can be political in many ways. It can be political about who gets to see it, or who can afford to see it, who is it for, uh, how long does it last for. Um, so I, I think um, I still think the act. I still think this act feels vaguely political of assembling as people together um, to engage with a story or a debate. Any other? Yeah, sure. This is sort of a, an extension of that, 
and it's really just a question for Anne, sorry, but I wanted to know about why you decided to, to, produce, to write this very American play that is really sort of only essentially American about the American moment, but have it here in London uh, in front of an audience that, uh, I mean, I'm American and maybe there are others of us here, but will be a very small percentage of Americans. Hail American. Um, <laughs> uh, that really just has to do with the theater logistics, um, states versus here. Um, I had written the play. I completed it in April. At that point, the U.S. seasons are pretty set, especially for a play this size, which is expensive for us, eight characters. That's, it's a big, um, um, it's a lot for a theater in America to do. Um, especially on short notice, and I had um, I had finished it. I had only just barely sent into the world, and Stephanie, kind of by chance, <laughs> stole it <laughs> on a trip to New York, <laughs> um, ran across it, and uh, so I got an email from Rupert saying it has come to my attention that you have this some sort of a play, and so I sent it to him and said, that, uh, "You're not going to want to do this in um, Britain. It's a really American play," and he wrote back the next day and said, oh, "We might actually." Hmm. Um, so, so that's, yes, that's how it got done um, here first. I mean, there's always, I love the Almeida very much, and to do, to premiere a work at the Almeida um, is, is amazing in that way. But it also, yeah, it just, it was sort of a question of logistics. It also has felt, um, it's kind of in a, it's kind of in a great um, thing for the play to sort out in terms of uh, how the play lives, uh, and how the play lives in an audience, to what degree um, it speaks to everyone, and to what degree it speaks only to Americans. It was very helpful to have a, a rehearsal room, um, you know, made up entirely of British people um, heading toward a production here. It really helped to sort out what in the play was what. Um, I think maybe we have probably one time for one more question. I think. Um, to, I think design is dramaturgy. Um, so I, I try to be as involved as possible. Um, and in, there's some of, the, some of the design that you see sort of comes from the sort of the conception of the play. And some of it was brought by the designers who were all um, freaking amazing. Um, but you do want to be there to sort of negotiate that process because because um, design can utterly change the meaning of the entire play. So, um, yeah. Cool. Um, I think we might need to uh, wrap up now. But um, thanks to both of you. It was really um, great chat. And thanks for coming as well. Yeah, and thank um, you very much. hope you enjoyed it. Wrap up your time.